The Hillsborough Disaster Wikipedia posts refers to vandalism edits on various Wikipedia articles, yet mostly the Hillsborough Disaster article, via the use of British government computers, causing a British government scandal. On the April 24, 2014, Oliver Duggan, in the Liverpool Echo, reported that users of computers that used IP addresses registered to the government secure internet had added derogatory and offensive material to Wikipedia articles, particularly the article about the Hillsborough disaster. The vandalism was quickly re-reported by other media, and subsequent reports highlighted other acts of vandalism, on various articles, originated by computers using those IP addresses. After an investigation by the Daily Telegraph and Wikipediacracy, the person behind the edits was identified as a junior civil servant within the UK government and was dismissed. Before the disaster Venue Hillsborough Stadium had been constructed in 1899 to house Sheffield Wednesday. It was selected by the Football Association as a neutral venue to host the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest football clubs. Kick-off was scheduled for 3 p.m. on April 15, and fans were advised to take up positions 15 minutes beforehand. At the time of the disaster most English football stadiums had high steel fencing between the spectators and the playing field in response to pitch invasions. Hooliganism had affected the sport for some years and was particularly virulent in England. From 1974, when these security standards were put in place, crushes occurred in several English stadiums. A report by Eastwood and Partners for a safety certificate for the stadium in 1978 concluded that although it failed to meet the recommendations of the Green Guide, a guide to safety at sports grounds, the consequences were minor. It emphasized the general situation at Hillsborough was satisfactory compared with most grounds. Sheffield Wednesday were later criticized for neglecting safety in the stadium, especially after an incident in the semi-final of the 1981 FA Cup. The Leppings Lane end of the ground did not hold a valid safety certificate at the time of the disaster. It had not been updated since 1979. Risks associated with confining fans in pens were highlighted by the Committee of Inquiry into Crowd Safety at Sports Grounds after the Bradford City Stadium fire in May 1985. It made recommendations on the safety of crowds penned within fences, including that all exit gates should be manned at all times, and capable of being opened immediately from the inside by anyone in an emergency. Previous Incidents South Yorkshire Police Command Changes Police presence at the previous year's FA Cup semi-final had been overseen by Chief Superintendent Brian L. Mole. Mole had supervised numerous police deployments at the stadium in the past. In October 1988 a probationary PC in Mole's F Division, South Yorkshire was handcuffed, photographed, and stripped by fellow officers in a fake robbery as a hazing prank. Four officers resigned and seven were disciplined over the incident. Chief Superintendent Mole himself was to be transferred to the Barnsley Division for career development reasons. The transfer was to be done with immediate effect on March 27, 1989. Meanwhile, Hillsborough was accepted as the FA Cup semi-final venue on March 20, 1989 by the Football Association. The first planning meeting for the semi-final took place on March 22 and was attended by newly promoted Chief Superintendent David Duck Enfield, not by Mole. No known minutes exist of this meeting. Although Mole could have been assigned the semi-final matches planning despite his transfer, that was not done. This left planning for the semi-final match to Duck Enfield, who had never commanded a sell-out football match before and who had very little, if any training or personal experience in how to do so. Disaster Build up Opposing supporters were segregated, as is common at domestic matches in England. Nottingham Forest supporters were allocated the South Stands and Spian Cop on the East End, with a combined capacity of 29,800, reached by 60 turnstiles spaced along two sides of the ground. 
Liverpool supporters were allocated the north and west ends, holding 24,256 fans, reached by 23 turnstiles from a narrow concourse. Turnstiles numbered 1 to 10, 10 in all, provided access to 9,700 seats in the north stand, a further six turnstiles provided access to 4,456 seats in the upper tier of the west stand. Finally, seven turnstiles provided access to 10,100 standing places in the lower tier of the west stand. Although Liverpool had more supporters, Nottingham Forest was allocated the larger area, to avoid the approach routes of rival fans crossing. As a result of the stadium layout and segregation policy, turnstiles that would normally have been used to enter the north stand from the east were off-limits and all Liverpool supporters had to converge on a single entrance at Leppings Lane. On the day of the match, radio and television broadcasters advised fans without tickets not to attend. Rather than establishing crowd safety as their top priority, the clubs, local authorities and police viewed their roles and responsibilities through the lens of hooliganism. Timeline Three chartered trains transported Liverpool supporters to Sheffield for a match in 1988, but only one such train ran in 1989. The 350 passengers arrived at the ground at about 2.20 p.m. Many supporters wished to enjoy the day and were in no hurry to enter the stadium too early. Some supporters were delayed by roadworks while crossing the Pennines on the M62 motorway which resulted in minor traffic congestion. Between 2.30 p.m. and 2.40 p.m., there was a build-up of supporters outside the turnstiles facing Leppings Lane, eager to enter the stadium before the game began. At 2.46 p.m., the BBC's football commentator John Mosun had already noticed the uneven distribution of people in the Leppings Lane pens. While rehearsing for the match off-air, he suggested a nearby cameraman look as well. There's gaps, you know, in parts of the ground. Well, if you look at the Liverpool end, to the right of the goal, there's hardly anybody on those steps, that's it. Look down there. Outside the stadium, a bottleneck developed with more fans arriving than could be safely filtered through the turnstiles before 3 p.m. People presenting tickets at the wrong turnstiles and those who had been refused entry could not leave because of the crowd behind them and remained as an obstruction. Fans outside could hear cheering as the teams came on the pitch 10 minutes before the match started, and as the match kicked off, but could not gain entrance. A police constable radioed control requesting that the game be delayed, as it had been two years before, to ensure the safe passage of supporters into the ground. The request to delay the start of the match by 20 minutes was declined. With an estimated 5,000 fans trying to enter through the turnstiles, and increasing safety concerns, the police, to avoid fatalities outside the ground, opened a large exit gate that ordinarily permitted the free flow of supporters departing the stadium. Two further gates were subsequently opened to relieve pressure. After an initial rush, thousands of supporters entered the stadium steadily at a fast walk. Crush When the gates were opened, thousands of fans entered a narrow tunnel leading from the rear of the terrace into two overcrowded central pens, creating pressure at the front. Hundreds of people were pressed against one another and the fencing by the weight of the crowd behind them. People entering were unaware of the problems at the fence, police or stewards usually stood at the entrance to the tunnel and, when the central pens reached capacity, directed fans to the side pens, but on this occasion, for reasons not fully explained, they did not. The match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest began as scheduled at 3 p.m. Fans were still streaming into pens 3 and 4 from the rear entrance tunnel as the match began. For some time, problems at the front of the Liverpool central goal pens went largely unnoticed except by those inside them and a few police at that end of the pitch. Liverpool's goalkeeper, Bruce Grobelar, reported fans from behind him pleading to him for help as the situation worsened. 
the police at first attempted to stop fans from spilling out of the pens, some believing this to be a pitch invasion. At approximately 3.04 p.m., a shot from Liverpool's Peter Beardsley hit the bar. Possibly connected to the excitement, a surge in three Peruvian nuevos caused one of its metal crush barriers to give way. South Yorkshire Police Superintendent Greenwood realised the situation, and ran on the field to gain referee Ray Lewis's attention. Lewis stopped the match at 3 hours 5 minutes and 30 seconds as fans climbed the fence in an effort to escape the crush and went onto the track. By this time, a small gate in the fence had been forced open and some fans escaped via this route, as others continued to climb over the fencing. Other fans were pulled to safety by fans in the west stand above the Leppings Lane Terrace. The intensity of the crush broke more crush barriers on the terraces. Holes in the perimeter fencing were made by fans desperately attempting to rescue others. The crowd in the Leppings Lane stand spilt onto the pitch, where the many injured and traumatized fans who had climbed to safety congregated. Football players from both teams were ushered to their respective dressing rooms, and told that there would be a 30 minute postponement. Those still trapped in the pens were packed so tightly that many victims died of compressive asphyxia while standing. Meanwhile, on the pitch, police, stewards and members of the St. John Ambulance Service were overwhelmed. Many uninjured fans assisted the injured, several attempted CPR and others tore down advertising hoardings to use as stretchers. Chief Superintendent John Nesbitt of South Yorkshire Police later briefed Michael Schurz by MP that leaving the rescue to the fans was a deliberate strategy and is quoted as saying we let the fans help so that they would not take out their frustration on the police at a police federation conference. Sima's response to the crush Reactions Condolences flooded in from across the world, led by the Queen. Other messages came from Pope John Paul II, US President George H. W. Bush and the chief executive of Juventus amongst many others. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and Home Secretary Douglas Hurd visited Hillsborough the day after the disaster and met survivors. Anfield Stadium was opened on the Sunday to allow fans to pay tribute to the dead. Thousands of fans visited and the stadium filled with flowers, scarves, and other tributes. In the following days more than 200,000 people visited the shrine inside the stadium. The following Sunday, a link of football scarves spanning the one-mile distance across Stanley Park from Goodison Park to Anfield was created, with the final scarf in position at 3.06 p.m. Elsewhere on the same day, a silence opened with an air raid siren at 3 o'clock was held in central Nottingham with the colours of Forest, Liverpool and Wednesday adorning Nottingham Council House. At Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral, a requiem mass attended by 3,000 people was held by the Catholic Archbishop of Liverpool, Derek Warlock. The first reading was read by Liverpool goalkeeper Bruce Grabelar. Liverpool players Ronnie Wellen, Steve Nicol, and former manager Joe Fagan carried the communion bread and wine. The FA chief executive Graham Kelly, who had attended the match, said the FA would conduct an inquiry into what had happened. Speaking after the disaster, Kelly backed all Cedar stadiums, saying we must move fans away from the ritual of standing on terraces. Standing on terraces and the use of perimeter fencing around the pitch, the use of CCTV, the timing of football matches and policing of sporting events were factors for a subsequent inquiry to consider. UEFA President Jacques Georges caused controversy by describing the Liverpool supporters as beasts wrongly suggesting that hooliganism was the cause of the disaster, which had occurred less than four years after the Heisel Stadium disaster. His remarks led to Liverpool FC calling for his resignation, but he apologised on discovering hooliganism was not the cause. At the 1989 FA Cup final between Liverpool and local rivals Everton, held just five weeks after the Hillsborough disaster, the players from both participating teams wore black armbands as a gesture of respect to the victims. During the final match of the 1988 89 English Football League season, contested on May 26, 1989, between Liverpool and second place Arsenal, they
Arsenal players presented flowers to fans in different parts of Anfield in memory of those who had died in the Hillsborough disaster. Disaster Appeal Fund A disaster appeal fund was set up with donations of £500,000 from the UK government, £100,000 from Liverpool FC and £25,000 each from the cities of Liverpool, Sheffield and Nottingham. The Liverpool FC donation was the amount the club would have received had the semi-final gone ahead as planned. Within days, donations had passed £1 million, swelled by donations from individuals, schools and businesses. Other fundraising activities included a factory records benefit concert and several fundraising football matches. The two teams involved in the Bradford City Stadium fire, Bradford City and Lincoln City, met for the first time since the 1985 disaster in a game that raised £25,000 for the Hillsborough Fund. By the time the appeal closed in 1990, it had raised more than £12 million. Much of the money went to victims and relatives of those involved in the disaster and provided funds for a college course to improve the hospital phase of emergency care. In May 1989, a charity version of the Gary and the Pacemakers song Fairy Cross the Mirza was released in aid of those affected. The record was produced by Stock Aitken Waterman and featured Liverpool musicians Paul McCartney, Gary Marsden, Holly Johnson, and the Christians. It entered the UK singles chart at number one on May 20, and remained at the top of the chart for three weeks. Despite having stronger ties to Liverpool FC, Gary and the Pacemaker's earlier hit You'll Never Walk Alone was not used because it had recently been re-recorded for the Bradford City Stadium Fire Appeal. Effect on Survivors By the disaster's 10th anniversary in 1999, at least three people who survived were known to have taken their own lives. Another survivor had spent eight years in psychiatric care. There were cases of alcoholism, drug abuse, and collapsed marriages involving people who had witnessed the events. The lingering effects of the disaster were seen as a cause, or contributory factor, in all of these victims. In total, 97 people died as a result of injuries incurred during the disaster. 94 people, aged from 10 to 67 years old, died on the day, either at the stadium, in the ambulances, or shortly after arrival at hospital. A total of 766 people were reported to have suffered injuries, among whom 300 were hospitalist. The less seriously injured survivors who did not live in the Sheffield area were advised to seek treatment for their injuries at hospitals nearer to their homes. On April 19, the death toll reached 95 when 14-year-old Lee Nicole died in hospital after being taken off life support. The death toll reached 96 in March 1993, when artificial feeding and hydration were withdrawn from 22-year-old Tony Bland after nearly four years, during which time he had remained in a persistent vegetative state showing no sign of improvement. This followed a legal challenge in the High Court by his family to have his treatment withdrawn, a landmark challenge which succeeded in November 1992. Andrew Devine, aged 22 at the time of the disaster, suffered similar injuries to Tony Bland and was also diagnosed as being in a persistent vegetative state. In March 1997 just before the 8th anniversary of the disaster it was reported he had emerged from the condition and was able to communicate using a touch-sensitive pad, and he had been showing signs of awareness of his surroundings for up to three years before. Devine died in 2021, as a consequence of the injuries sustained at Hillsborough with his death being ruled by the coroner to have been an unlawful killing, raising the total death toll of the disaster to 97.2 sisters, three pairs of brothers, and a father and son were among those who died, as were two men about to become fathers for the first time, 25-year-old Stephen Brown of Wrexham and 30-year-old Peter Thompson of Widnes. John Paul Gilhooley, aged 10, was the youngest person to die. His cousin, Stephen Gerrard, then aged eight, went on to become Liverpool F.C.S. captain.
Gerard has said the disaster inspired him to lead the team he supported as a boy and become a top professional football player. The oldest person to die at Hillsborough was 67-year-old Gerard Barron, an older brother of former Liverpool player Kevin Barron. Stephen Whittle is considered by some to be another victim of Hillsborough, as due to work commitments, he had sold his ticket to a friend, who then died in the disaster. The resulting feeling of survivor guilt is believed to be the main reason he took his own life in February 2011. The majority of victims who died were from Liverpool and Greater Merseyside. A further 20 were from counties adjacent to Merseyside. An additional three victims came from Sheffield with two more living in counties adjacent to South Yorkshire. The remaining 14 victims lived in other parts of England. Ages Of those who died, 79 were aged under 30, 38 of whom were under 20, and all but three of the victims were aged under 50. Andrew Devine, who was 22 at the time of the disaster, died in 2021 at the age of 55. 1989-1991 Coroner's Hearing Inquests into the deaths were opened and adjourned immediately after the disaster. Resumed on November 19, 1990, they proved to be controversial. South Yorkshire coroner Dr. Stephen Popper limited the main inquests to events up to 3.15 p.m. on the day of the disaster nine minutes after the match was halted and the crowd spilt onto the pitch. Popper said this was because the victims were either dead, or brain dead, by 3.15 p.m. The decision angered the families many of whom felt the inquests were unable to consider the response of the police and other emergency services after that time. The inquests returned verdicts of accidental death on March 26, 1991, much to the dismay of the bereaved families, who had been hoping for a verdict of unlawful killing or an open verdict, and for manslaughter charges to be brought against the officers who had been present at the disaster. Trevor Hicks whose two daughters had been killed, described the verdicts as lawful but immoral. Popper's decision regarding the cut-off time was subsequently endorsed by the divisional court who considered it to have been justified in the light of the medical evidence available to him. Relatives later failed to have the inquests reopened to allow more scrutiny of police actions and closer examination of the circumstances of individual cases. Families believed that Popper was too close to the police. After the verdicts Barry Devon side, who had lost his son, witnessed Popper hosting a celebration party with police officers. Point one of the individual cases where the circumstances of death were not fully resolved was that of Kevin Williams, the 15-year-old son of Ann Williams. Ann Williams, who died in 2013, rejected the coroner's decision that the Hillsborough victims, including her son, had died before 3.15 p.m citing witness statements that described him showing signs of life at 4 p.m. She unsuccessfully appealed to the European Court of Human Rights in 2009. The Hillsborough Independent Panel considered the available evidence and stated that the initial pathologist's opinion appeared definitive, but further authoritative opinions raised significant doubts about the accuracy of that initial opinion. Popper had excluded the witness evidence of two qualified Merseyside doctors who had been inside the stadium on the day and who had been critical of the chaotic emergency response. The views of both were dismissed by the Taylor Report. They both gave evidence at the 2016 Warrington inquests. Phillips stated that the exclusion of their evidence was a serious error of judgment by Popper. He said that he could not fathom why he didn't call us other than he specifically did not want to hear our evidence, in which case the first inquests were colored and flawed before they even started. Ashton and Phillips were not the only doctors present at the disaster not to be called to give evidence to the pauper inquests. The only one called was the Sheffield Wednesday Club doctor. Taylor Inquiry After the disaster, Lord Justice Taylor was appointed to conduct an inquiry into the events. The Taylor Inquiry sat for a total of 31 days and published two reports, an interim report which laid out the events of the day and immediate conclusions, 
and a final report which outlined general recommendations on football ground safety. The two publications together became known as the Taylor Report. Taylor concluded that policing on the day broke down and the main reason for the disaster was the failure of police control. Attention was focused on the decision to open the secondary gates, moreover, the kickoff should have been delayed, as had been done at other venues and matches. Sheffield Wednesday was also criticised for the inadequate number of turnstiles at the Leppings Lane end and the poor quality of the crush barriers on the terraces, respects in which failure by the club contributed to this disaster. Police Control Taylor found there was no provision for controlling the entry of spectators into the turnstile area. He dismissed the claim by senior police officers that they had no reason to anticipate problems since congestion had occurred at both the 1987 and 1988 semi-finals. He said that the operational order and police tactics on the day failed to provide for controlling a concentrated arrival of large numbers should that occur in a short period. That it might so occur was foreseeable. The failure by the police to give the order to direct fans to empty areas of the stadium, was described by Taylor as a blunder of the first magnitude. There was no means for calculating when individual enclosures had reached capacity. A police officer ordinarily made a visual assessment before guiding fans to other pens. However, on the day of the disaster, by 2.52 p.m. when Gate C was opened, pens 3 and 4 were over full to allow any more into those pens was likely to cause injuries to allow in a large stream was courting disaster. The report noted that the official capacity of the central pens was 2,200, that the health and safety executive found this should have been reduced to 1,693 due to crush barriers and perimeter gates, but actually an estimated 3,000 people were in the pens around 3 p.m. The report said when spectators first appeared on the track, the immediate assumption in the control room was that a pitch invasion was threatened. This was unlikely at the beginning of a match. It became still less likely when those on the track made no move towards the pitch. Here was no effective leadership either from control or on the pitch to harness and organize rescue efforts. No orders were given for officers to enter the tunnel and relieve pressure. Further that, the anxiety to protect the sanctity of the pitch has caused insufficient attention to be paid to the risk of a crush due to overcrowding. Regarding the decision to allocate Liverpool spectators to the west and north ends, Taylor stated I do not consider choice of ends was causative of the disaster. Had it been reversed, the disaster could well have occurred in a similar manner but to Nottingham supporters. Lord Taylor noted with regard to the performance of the senior police officers in command that, Neither their handling of the problems on the day nor their account of it in evidence showed the qualities of leadership to be expected of their rank. Behavior of Fans Lord Taylor concluded that the behavior of Liverpool fans, including accusations of drunkenness, were secondary factors, and said that most fans were, not drunk, nor even the worse for drink. He concluded that this formed an exacerbating factor but that police, seeking to rationalize their loss of control, overestimated the element of drunkenness in the crowd. The report dismissed the theory, put forward by South Yorkshire police, that fans attempting to gain entry without tickets or with forged tickets were contributing factors. Emergency Response Taylor concluded that in responding to the disaster there had been no fault on the part of the emergency services. Police Evasion Taylor concluded his criticism of South Yorkshire police by describing senior officers in command as defensive and evasive witnesses who refused to accept any responsibility for error, in all some 65 police officers gave oral evidence at the inquiry. Sadly I must report that for the most part the quality of their evidence was in inverse proportion to their rank. Further stating, South Yorkshire police were not prepared to concede they were in any respect at fault in what occurred. He police case was to blame the fans for being late and drunk, and to blame the club for failing to monitor the pens. Such an unrealistic approach gives cause for anxiety as to whether lessons have been learnt.
Effect on Stadiums in Britain The Taylor Report had a deep impact on safety standards for stadiums in the UK. Perimeter and lateral fencing was removed and many top stadiums were converted to all-seated. Purpose-built stadiums for Premier League and most football league teams since the report are all-seater. Chester City F.C.S. Davis Stadium was the first English football stadium to fulfill the safety recommendations of the Taylor Report, with Millwall F.C.S. The Den being the first new stadium to be built that fulfilled the recommendations. In July 1992, the government announced a relaxation of the regulation for the lower two English leagues. The Football Spectators Act does not cover Scotland but the Scottish Premier League chose to make all-seater stadiums a requirement of league membership. In England and Wales all-seating is a requirement of the Premier League and of the Football League for clubs who have been present in the championship for more than three seasons. Several campaigns have attempted to get the government to relax the regulation and allow standing areas to return to Premiership and Championship grounds. Stuart Smith Scrutiny in May 1997, when the Labour Party came into office, Home Secretary Jack Straw ordered an investigation. It was performed by Lord Justice Stuart Smith. The appointment of Stuart Smith was not without controversy. At a meeting in Liverpool with relatives of those involved in Hillsborough in October 1997, he flippantly remarked Have you got a few of your people or are they like the Liverpool fans? turn up at the last minute. He later apologized for his remark, saying it was not intended to offend. The terms of reference of his inquiry were limited to new evidence, that is, evidence which was not available or was not presented to the previous inquiries, courts or authorities. Therefore, evidence such as witness statements which had been altered were classed as inadmissible. When he presented his report in February 1998, he concluded that there was insufficient evidence for a new inquiry into the disaster. In paragraph 5 of his summary, Lord Justice Stuart Smith said, I have come to the clear conclusion that there is no basis upon which there should be a further judicial inquiry or a reopening of Lord Taylor's inquiry. There is no basis for a renewed application to the Divisional Court or for the Attorney General to exercise his powers under the Coroner's Act 1988. I do not consider that there is any material which should be put before the Director of Public Prosecutions or the Police Complaints Authority which might cause them to reconsider the decisions they have already taken. Nor do I consider that there is any justification for setting up any further inquiry into the performance of the emergency and hospital services. I have considered the circumstances in which alterations were made to some of the self-written statements of South Yorkshire police officers, but I do not consider that there is any occasion for any further investigation. Importantly, Stuart Smith's report supported the coroner's assertion that evidence after 3.15 p.m. was inadmissible as that by 3.15 p.m. the principal cause of death, that is, the crushing, was over. This was controversial as the subsequent response of the police and emergency services would not be scrutinized. Announcing the report to the House of Commons Home Secretary Jack Straw backed Stuart Smith's findings and said that I do not believe that a further inquiry could or would uncover significant new evidence or provide any relief for the distress of those who have been bereaved. However, the determination by Stuart Smith was heavily criticized by the Justice Minister, Lord Falconer, who stated I am absolutely sure that Sir Murray Stuart Smith came completely to the wrong conclusion. Falconer added, it made the families in the Hillsborough disaster feel after one establishment cover-up, here was another. Hillsborough Independent Panel The Hillsborough Independent Panel was instituted in 2009 by the British government to investigate the Hillsborough disaster, to oversee the disclosure of documents about the disaster and its aftermath and to produce a report. On September 12, 2012, it published its report and simultaneously launched a website containing 450,000 pages of material collated from 85 organizations and individuals over two years. History In the years after the disaster, 
the Hillsborough Family Support Group had campaigned for the release of all relevant documents into the public domain. After the disaster's 20th anniversary in April 2009, supported by the Culture Secretary Andy Burnham and Minister of State for Justice, Maria Eagle, the government asked the Home Office and Department of Culture, Media and Sport to investigate the best way for this information to be made public. In April 2009, the Home Secretary Jackie Smith announced she had requested secret files concerning the disaster be made public. In December 2009, Home Secretary Alan Johnson said the Hillsborough Independent Panel's remit would be to oversee full public disclosure of relevant government and local information within the limited constraints set out in the disclosure protocol and consult with the Hillsborough families to ensure that the views of those most affected by the disaster are taken into account. An archive of all relevant documentation would be created and a report produced within two years explaining the work of the panel and its conclusions. The panel was chaired by James Jones, the Bishop of Liverpool. Other members were Rayu Bat, human rights lawyer. Christine Gifford, expert in the field of access to information. Katie Jones, investigative journalist. Bill Kirkup. Associate Chief Medical Officer in the Department of Health. Paul Layton, former Deputy Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland. Professor Phil Scraton, expert in criminology. Peter Sissons, broadcaster. Sarah Tyak, formerly Chief Executive of the National Archives. Findings On September 12, 2012, the Hillsborough Independent Panel concluded that no Liverpool fans were responsible in any way for the disaster, and that its main cause was a lack of police control. Crowd safety was compromised at every level and overcrowding issues had been recorded two years earlier. The panel concluded that up to 41 of the 96 who had died up to that date, might have survived had the emergency services reactions and CO ordination been better. The number is based on post-mortem examinations which found some victims may have had heart, lung, or blood circulation function for some time after being removed from the crush. The report stated that placing fans who were merely unconscious on their backs rather than in the recovery position, would have resulted in their deaths due to airway obstruction. Their report was in 395 pages and delivered 153 key findings. The findings concluded that 164 witness statements had been altered. Of those statements, 116 were amended to remove or change negative comments about South Yorkshire Police. South Yorkshire Police had performed blood alcohol tests on the victims, some of them children, and ran computer checks on the National Police database in an attempt to impugn their reputation. The report concluded that the then-conservative MP for Sheffield Hallam, Irvine Patnick, passed inaccurate and untrue information from the police to the press. The panel noted that, despite being dismissed by the Taylor report, the idea that alcohol contributed to the disaster proved remarkably durable. Documents disclosed confirm that repeated attempts were made to find supporting evidence for alcohol being a factor, and that available evidence was significantly misinterpreted. It noted the weight placed on alcohol in the face of objective evidence of a pattern of consumption modest for a leisure event was inappropriate. It has since fueled persistent and unsustainable assertions about drunken fan behavior. The evidence it released online included altered police reports. Effects Subsequent apologies were released by Prime Minister David Cameron on behalf of the government, Ed Mealy Band on behalf of the opposition. Sheffield Wednesday Football Club, South Yorkshire Police, and former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, who apologized for making false accusations under the headline The Truth. McKenzie said he should have written a headline that read The Lies, although this apology was rejected by the Hillsborough Family Support Group and Liverpool fans, as it was seen to be shifting the blame once again. After publication, the Hillsborough Families Support Group called for new inquests for the victims. 
They also called for prosecutions for unlawful killing, corporate manslaughter, and perversion of the course of justice in respect of the actions of the police both in causing the disaster and covering up their actions, and in respect of Sheffield Wednesday FC, Sheffield Council and the Football Association for their various responsibilities for providing, certifying and selecting the stadium for the fatal event. Calls were made for the resignation of police officers involved in the cover-up, and for Sheffield Wednesday, the police and the Football Association to admit their blame. Calls were also made for Sir Dave Richards to resign as chairman of the Premier League and give up his knighthood as a result of his conduct at Sheffield Wednesday at the time of the disaster. The Home Secretary called for investigations into law-breaking and promised resources to investigate individual or systematic issues. On October 23, 2012, Norman Bet Eisen resigned with immediate effect as Chief Constable of West Yorkshire Police after Maria Eagle MP on the floor of the House and protected by parliamentary privilege, accused him of boasting about concocting a story that all the Liverpool fans were drunk and police were afraid they were going to break down the gates and decided to open them. Bet Eisen denied the claim, and other allegations about his conduct, saying, Fans' behaviour, to the extent that it was relevant at all, made the job of the police, in the crush outside Lepping's Lane turnstiles, harder than it needed to be. But it didn't cause the disaster any more than the sunny day that encouraged people to linger outside the stadium as kick-off approached. I held those views then, I hold them now. I have never, since hearing the Taylor evidence unfold, offered any other interpretation in public or private. Merseyside Police Authority confirmed that Bet Eisen would receive an £83,000 pension, unless convicted of a criminal offence. Hillsborough families called for the payments to be frozen during the IPCC investigation. In the same 22 October House of Commons debate, Stephen Mosley MP alleged West Midlands police pressured witnesses both police and civilians to change their statements. Maria Eagle confirmed her understanding that WMP actions in this respect would be the subject of IPCC scrutiny. Second Coroner's Hearing Following an application on December 19, 2012 by the Attorney General Dominic Grieve, the High Court quashed the verdicts in the original inquests and ordered fresh inquests to be held. Sir John Goldring was appointed as Assistant Coroner for South Yorkshire and West Yorkshire to conduct those inquests. The inquests hearings started on Monday, March 31, 2014 at Warrington. Transcripts of the proceedings and evidence that was produced during the hearings were published at the Hillsborough Inquest's official website. On April 6, 2016, the nine jurors were sent out to consider their verdicts. These were formally given to the inquests at 11 o'clock on April 26, 2016. The jury returned a verdict of unlawful killing in respect of all 96 victims. Upon receiving the April 2016 verdict, Hillsborough Family Support Group Chair Margaret Aspinall, whose 18-year-old son James was killed in the disaster, said, Let's be honest about this people were against us. We had the media against us, as well as the establishment. Everything was against us. The only people that weren't against us was our own city. That's why I am so grateful to my city and so proud of my city. They always believed in us. On the day after the verdicts were reached, the Home Secretary, Theresa May, made a statement to Parliament which included the verdicts of the jury to the 14 questions they had been asked regarding the roles of South Yorkshire Police, the South Yorkshire Metropolitan Ambulance Service, Sheffield Wednesday Football Club and Hillsborough Stadium's engineers and two specific questions specific relating to the time and cause of death for each of the dead. In addition to the unlawful killing verdict, the jury concluded that errors or omissions by police commanding officers, Sheffield Wednesday, the ambulance service and the design and certification of the stadium had all caused or contributed to the deaths, but that the behavior of football supporters had not. In all but one case, 
the jury recorded the time of death as later than the 3.15 p.m. cut-off point adopted by the coroner at the original inquests. Prime Minister David Cameron also responded to the April 2016 verdict by saying that it represented a long overdue but landmark moment in the quest for justice, adding all families and survivors now have official confirmation of what they always knew was the case, that the Liverpool fans were utterly blameless in the disaster that unfolded at Hillsborough. The Labour Party described the handling of the Hillsborough disaster as the greatest miscarriage of justice of our times, with Labour MPs Andy Burnham and Steve Rotheram calling for accountability in the prosecution of those responsible. Liberal Democrat MP John Pugh called for David Cameron to make a formal apology in the House of Commons to the families of those killed at Hillsborough and to the city of Liverpool as a whole. Echoing his 2012 expression of regret, former Home Secretary Jack Straw apologised to the families for the failures of his 1997 review of the disaster. Kelvin McKenzie, who wrote the now infamous The Truth front page for The Sun, said that although he was duped into publishing his story, that his heart goes out to the families of those affected, saying that it's quite clear today the fans had nothing to do with it. However, Mackenzie did not accept any personal responsibility for the story. During the inquests, Maxwell Groom, a police constable at the time of the disaster, made allegations of a high level conspiracy by Freemasons to shift blame for the disaster onto Superintendent Roger Marshall also that junior officers were pressured into changing their statements after the disaster, and told not to write their accounts in their official police pocketbooks. Groom also claimed that match commander Duck Enfield was a member of the highly influential Dole Lodge in Sheffield. Coroner Sir John Goldring warned the jury that there was not a shred of evidence that any Masonic meeting actually took place, or that those named were all Freemasons advising the jury to cast aside gossip and hearsay. During the inquests, Duck Enfield confirmed that he became a Freemason in 1975 and became worshipful master of his local lodge in 1990, a year after the disaster. Following this revelation, Freemasons were forbidden to take part in the IPCC investigation and Operation Resolve as civilian investigators to prevent any perceived bias. Independent Police Complaints Commission Investigation Following the inquest's verdicts, South Yorkshire Police announced it would refer the actions of its officers to the Independent Police Complaints Commission. West Yorkshire Police announced it would refer its Chief Constable, Norman Bet Eisen, to the IPCC in mid-September. Bet Eisen had been one of a number of police officers who were accused of manipulating evidence by the Hillsborough Independent Panel. In early October, Bet Eisen announced his retirement, becoming the first senior figure to step down since publication of the panel's report. The IPCC announced on October 12, 2012, that it would investigate the failure of the police to declare a major incident failure to close the tunnel to the stands which led to overcrowded pens despite evidence it had been closed in such circumstances in the past, changes made to the statements of police officers, actions which misled Parliament and the media, shortcomings of previous investigations, and the role played by Norman Bet Eisen. By October 22, 2012, the names of at least 1,444 serving and former police officers had been referred to the IPCC investigation. In its announcement, the IPCC praised the tenacity of the Hillsborough family's campaign for truth and justice. On October 16, 2012, the Attorney General announced in Parliament he had applied to have the original inquest's verdicts quashed arguing it proceeded on a false basis and evidence now to hand required this exceptional step. On July 12, 2013, it was reported that the IPCC had found that in addition to the now 164 police statements known to have been altered, a further 55 police officers had changed their statements. Deborah Glass, deputy chair of the IPCC said, we know the people who have contacted us are the tip of the iceberg. 
That was after the IPCC's Hillsboro contact team had received 230 pieces of correspondence since October 2012. The IPCC is also investigating the actions of West Midlands Police, who in 1989 had been tasked with investigating South Yorkshire Police's conduct for both the original inquests and also the Taylor Independent Inquiry. In April 2016, the Crown Prosecution Service announced that it would consider bringing charges against both individuals and corporate bodies once the criminal investigation by the Independent Police Complaints Commission Operation Resolve had been completed. The Patronizing Disposition of Unaccountable Power Report Commissioned by the Home Secretary Theresa May a report was published on November 1, 2017 by the Right Reverend James Jones titled The Patronizing Disposition of Unaccountable Power, a report to ensure that the pain and suffering of the Hillsborough families is not repeated. Criminal and Civil Cases Prosecutions In February 2000, a private prosecution was brought against Chief Superintendent David Duck Enfield and another officer, Bernard Murray. The prosecution argued that the crush was foreseeable hence the defendants were grossly negligent. Prosecutor Ellen Jones told the court that Duck Enfield gave the order to open the gates so that hundreds of fans could be herded onto the already crowded terraces at the stadium. Jones stated that minutes after the disaster, Duck Enfield deceitfully and dishonestly told senior FA officials that the supporters had forced the gate open. Duck Enfield admitted that he had lied in certain statements regarding the causes of the disaster. The prosecution ended on July 24, 2000, when Murray was acquitted and the jury was unable to reach a verdict in the case of Duck Enfield. On July 26, the judge refused the prosecution's application for a retrial of Duck Enfield. Police disciplinary charges were abandoned when Duck Enfield retired on health grounds and because Murray was unavailable, it was decided not to proceed with disciplinary charges against him. Duck Enfield took medical retirement on a full police pension. Home Secretary Theresa May announced on December 18, 2012 that a new police inquiry would be initiated to examine the possibility of charging agencies other than the police over the Hillsborough deaths. The inquiry was first headed by former Durham Chief Constable John Stoddart and later by Assistant Commissioner Rob Beckley. On June 28, 2017, it was announced that six people were to be charged with offences in relation to the disaster. Former Chief Superintendent Duck Enfield, in charge of the match, faced 95 counts of manslaughter by gross negligence. He faced no charge in respect of the death of Tony Bland, who died four years after the disaster. Former Chief Inspector Sir Norman Bedenson faced four counts of misconduct in public office. Former Sheffield Wednesday FC Club Secretary Graham McCrell faced a charge of breaching the Safety at Sports Ground Act 1975. Solicitor Peter Metcalf, former Chief Superintendent Donald Denton, and former Detective Chief Inspector Alan Foster were all charged with perverting the course of justice for having altered 68 police officers' statements in order to mask the failings of the police force. On August 9, 2017, all except Duck Enfield appeared at Warrington Magistrates Court. McCrell pleaded not guilty to the charge against him. No formal pleas were taken from the other four defendants. All five were bailed to appear at the Crown Court in September. Duck Enfield was not required to appear as the Crown Prosecution Service needed to apply to the High Court to lift a court order before he could be prosecuted on the manslaughter charges. On June 29, 2018, a ruling was made that Duck Enfield would be prosecuted on the manslaughter charges. It was announced in December 2017 that a police officer and a farrier would not be prosecuted over allegations that they fabricated a story about a police horse being burned with cigarettes at Hillsborough. Although there was enough evidence to charge the farrier with perverting the course of justice, it was felt not to be in the public interest to charge him. There was insufficient evidence against the police officer to charge him with the offence. On August 21, 2018, 
it was announced that all charges against Bet Eisen were being dropped as the CPS felt that there was insufficient evidence to have a realistic chance of a conviction. The death of two witnesses and contradictions in the evidence of others were cited as part of the reason for the decision. Representatives of the 96 victims of the disaster stated that they would be asking for an independent review of the decision under the Right to Review scheme. At a trial preparation hearing at Preston Crown Court on September 10, 2018, Duck Enfield pleaded not guilty to all 95 charges against him. McCrell pleaded not guilty to the two charges against him. A provisional trial date was set for January 14, 2019 on which date the trial started at Preston Crown Court before Mr. Justice Openshaw. On March 13, 2019, it was reported that Duck Enfield would not be called to give evidence in his defense. It was also reported that the jury would be directed to find McCrell not guilty on the charge of contravening the stadium's safety certificate due to a lack of evidence. On April 3, the jury returned with a guilty verdict against McCrell on a health and safety charge but was unable to reach a verdict on Duck Enfield. It was announced on June 25 that Duck Enfield would face a retrial, which was scheduled to start on October 7 at Preston Crown Court. On November 28, 2019, Duck Enfield was found not guilty of gross negligence manslaughter. On May 26, 2021, Denton, Foster and Metcalf were all found not guilty of perverting the course of justice by altering 68 police officers' statements, when Mr. Justice William Davis found that they had no case to answer. The reason given was that the public inquiry in 1990, to which the altered statements were submitted, was not a statutory inquiry, and therefore not a court of law. Consequently, a course of public justice could not have been perverted. The ruling also noted that the original statements had neither been destroyed, nor had they been ordered to be destroyed. In response to the acquittals, leader of the House of Commons Jacob Rees-Mogg called the lack of accountability over Hillsborough the greatest scandal of British policing of our lifetimes. Garston and Halewood MP Maria Eagle called for the law to be changed to prevent another catastrophic failure of justice. Psychiatric Injury and Other Litigation Various negligence cases were brought against the police by spectators who had been at the ground but had not been in the pens, and by people who watched the incident unfolding on television. A case, Alcock v. Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police 1 AC 310, was eventually appealed to the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords and was an important milestone in the law of claims of secondary victims for negligently inflicted psychiatric injury. It was held that claimants who watched the disaster on television slash listened on radio were not proximal and their claims were rejected. Another psychiatric injury claim was brought to the House of Lords, White v. Chief Constable of the South Yorkshire Police 2 AC 455. It was brought by police officers on duty against the Chief Constable who was said to have been vicariously liable for the disaster. Their claims were dismissed and the Alcock decision was upheld. It affirmed the position of the courts once again towards claims of psychiatric injuries of secondary victims. A third legal case which resulted from the Hillsborough disaster was Airedale NHS Trust v Bland AC 789, a landmark House of Lords decision in English criminal law, that allowed the life support machine of Tony Bland, a Hillsborough victim in a persistent vegetative state, to be switched off. In April 2016, a private prosecution was launched on behalf of victims' relatives against both SYP and the West Midlands Police Force, alleging a concerted cover-up designed to shift blame away from the police. An agreement was reached in the case in April 2021, but reporting restrictions were put in place due to the pending trial of Denton, Foster and Metcalf. Following the finding that they did not have a case to answer, the restrictions were lifted. Memorials Permanent memorials Several memorials have been erected in memory of the victims of the Hillsborough disaster. Flames were added either side of the Liverpool FC crest in memory of the fans who lost their lives in the Hillsborough disaster. 
The Hillsboro Memorial at Anfield was located next to the Shankly Gates before it was moved to the front of the redeveloped main stand in 2016. It was modified with a 97th name after a victim of the disaster died in 2021. A memorial at Hillsboro Stadium, unveiled on the 10th anniversary of the disaster on April 15, 1999, reads, in memory of the 96 men, women, and children who tragically died and the countless people whose lives were changed forever. FA Cup Semi-Final Liverpool v Nottingham Forest April 15, 1989 You'll never walk alone. A memorial stone in the pavement on the south side of Liverpool's Anglican Cathedral. A memorial garden in Hillsborough Park with a You'll Never Walk Alone gateway. A headstone at the junction of Middlewood Road, Leppings Lane, and Wadsutty Lane, near the ground and by the Sheffield Super Tram route. A Hillsborough Memorial Rose Garden in Port Sunlight, Whirl. A Memorial Rose Garden on Sudley Estate in South Liverpool. Each of the six rose beds has a centerpiece of a white standard rosebush, surrounded by red rose bushes, named Liverpool Remember. There are brass memorial plagues on both sets of gates to the garden, and a sundial inscribed with the words, Time marches on but we will always remember. In the grounds of Crosby Library, to the memory of the 18 football fans from Sefton who lost their lives in the Hillsboro disaster. The memorial, sited in a raised rose bed containing the Liverpool Remembers Red Rose, is made of black granite. It is inscribed in loving memory of the 96 football supporters who died at Hillsboro, Sheffield on April 15, 1989. Of those who lost their lives the following young men were from Sefton families. The memorial was unveiled on October 4, 1991 by the mayor of Sefton, Councillor Sid Whitby. The project was carried out by the council after consultation with the Sefton Survivors Group. A seven-foot-high circular bronze memorial was unveiled in the Old Haymarket district of Liverpool in April 2013. This memorial is inscribed with the words, Hillsborough Disaster We Will Remember Them, and displays the names of the 96 victims who died. An eight-foot-high clock, dating from the 1780s, was installed at Liverpool Town Hall in April 2013, with the hands indicating 306. A memorial plaque dedicated to the 96 at Goodison Park in Liverpool, home of local rivals Everton FC. Hillsborough Oaks, 96 oak trees planted in Cross Hillocks Wood, next to the No Sleigh Expressway, with the memorial unveiled on September 20, 2000. Memorial Ceremonies The disaster has been acknowledged on April 15 every year by the community in Liverpool and football in general. An annual memorial ceremony is held at Anfield and at a church in Liverpool. The 10th and 20th anniversaries were marked by special services to remember the victims. From 2007, an annual Hillsborough memorial service was held at Spian Cop, KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. The ceremony was held on the Spian Cop battlefield, which gave its name to the Cop stand at Anfield. There is a permanent memorial to the 96 fans who died, in the form of a bench in view of the battlefield at a nearby lodge. Dean Davis and David Walters, South African Liverpool supporters, were responsible for the service and the bench was commissioned by Guy Prowse in 2008. Following on from the Hillsborough family's decision to conclude official memorials at Anfield with a final service in 2016, it was decided not to hold any further memorials at Spian Cop. The memorial bench remains at Spian Cop Lodge. In 2014, to mark the 25th anniversary of the disaster, the FA decided that all FA Cup, Premier League, Football League and Football Conference matches played between 11-14 April would kick off seven minutes later than originally scheduled with a six-minute delay and a one-minute silence tribute. 10th Anniversary In 1999, Anfield was packed with a crowd of around 10,000 people ten years after the disaster. A candle was lit for each of the 96 victims. 
The clock at the cop end stood still at 3.06 p.m., the time that the referee had blown his whistle in 1989 and a minute's silence was held, the start signalled by match referee from that day, Ray Lewis. A service led by the Right Reverend James Jones, the Bishop of Liverpool, was attended by past and present Liverpool players, including Robbie Fowler, Steve McManaman and Alan Hansen. According to the BBC report, the names of the victims were read from the memorial book and floral tributes were laid at a plaque bearing their names. A gospel choir performed and the ceremony ended with a rendition of You'll Never Walk Alone. The anniversary was also marked by a minute's silence at the weekend's league games and FA Cup semi-finals. 20th Anniversary In 2009, on the 20th anniversary of the disaster, Liverpool's request that their Champions League quarter-finals return leg, scheduled for April 15, be played the day before was granted. The event was remembered with a ceremony at Anfield attended by over 28,000 people. The COP, Centenary and Main Stands were opened to the public before part of the Anfield Road End was opened to supporters. The memorial service, led by the Bishop of Liverpool began at 14.45 BST and a two-minute silence was held at the time of the disaster 20 years earlier, 15.06 BST. Burnham, by then the sports minister, addressed the crowd but was heckled by supporters chanting justice for the 96. The ceremony was attended by survivors of the disaster, families of victims and the Liverpool team, with goalkeeper Pep Arena leading the team and management staff onto the pitch. Team captain Steven Gerrard and vice-captain Jamie Carragher handed the freedom of the city to the families of all the victims. Candles were lit for each of the 96 people who died. Kenny Dalglish, Liverpool's manager at the time of the disaster, read a passage from the Bible, Lamentations of Jeremiah. The Liverpool manager, Rafael Benitez, set 96 balloons free. The ceremony ended with 96 rings of church bells across the city and a rendition of You'll Never Walk Alone. Other services took place at the same time, including at the Anglican Liverpool Cathedral and the Roman Catholic Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral. After the two minutes' silence, bells on civic buildings rang out throughout Merseyside. A song was released to mark the 20th anniversary, entitled Fields of Anfield Road which peaked at number 14 in the UK charts. Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal and Manchester United players showed respect by wearing black armbands during their Champions League quarter-final matches on 14 and April 15, 2009. On May 14, more than 20,000 people packed Anfield for a match held in memory of the victims. The Liverpool legends, comprising ex-Liverpool footballers beat the All-Stars, captained by actor Ricky Tomlinson, 3-1. The event also raised cash for the Marina Dalglish appeal which was contributed towards a radiotherapy centre at University Hospital in Aintree. With the imminent release of police documents relating to events on April 15, 1989, the Hillsborough Family Support Group launched Project 96, a fundraising initiative on August 1, 2009. At least 96 current and former Liverpool footballers are being lined up to raise £96,000 by auctioning a limited edition signed photographs. On April 11, 2009, Liverpool fans sang You'll Never Walk Alone as a tribute to the upcoming anniversary of the disaster before the home game against Blackburn Rovers and was followed by former Liverpool player. Stephen Warnock presenting a memorial wreath to the cop showing the figure 96 in red flowers. Other Tributes The Hillsborough disaster touched not only Liverpool, but football clubs in England and around the world. Supporters of Everton, Liverpool's traditional local rivals, were affected, many of them having lost friends and family. Supporters laid down flowers and blue and white scarves to show respect for the dead and unity with fellow Merseysiders. On Wednesday, April 19, 1989, four days after the disaster, the second leg of the European Cup semi-final tie between AC Milan and Real Madrid was played. 
the referee blew his whistle two minutes into the game to stop play and a minute's silence was held for those who lost their lives at Hillsborough. Halfway through the minute's silence, the AC Milan fans sang Liverpool's You'll Never Walk Alone as a sign of respect. In April 1989, Bradford City and Lincoln City held a friendly match to benefit the victims of Hillsborough. The occasion was the first in which the two teams had met since the 1985 Bradford City Stadium fire that had claimed 56 lives at Valley Parade. On April 30, 1989, a friendly match organised by Celtic FC was played at Celtic Park, Glasgow, between the home club and Liverpool. This game was Liverpool's first appearance on the football field since the disaster two weeks earlier. The crowd numbered more than 60,000, including around 6,000 Liverpool fans, and all the match proceeds went to the Hillsborough Appeal Fund. Liverpool won the match by four goals to nil. As a result of the disaster, Liverpool's scheduled match against Arsenal was delayed from April 23 until the end of the season, and the game eventually decided the league title. At the rescheduled fixture, Arsenal players brought flowers onto the pitch and presented them to the Liverpool fans around the stadium before the game commenced. During a 2011 debate in the House of Commons, the Labour MP for Liverpool Walton, Steve Rotheram, read out a list of the victims and, as a result, the names were recorded in the Hansard transcripts. In December 2021, Liverpool City Council nominated Andrew Devine posthumously for the Freedom of the City of Liverpool, a tribute given to the original 96 victims in 2016. Controversies Media Portrayal Initial media coverage spurred by what Phil Scraton calls in Hillsborough, the truth the Heisel factor and hooligan hysteria began to shift the blame onto the behaviour of the Liverpool fans at the stadium, making it a public order issue. As well as the Sun's April 19, 1989 The Truth article other newspapers published similar allegations, the Daily Star headline on the same day reported dead fans robbed by drunk thugs, the Daily Mail accused the Liverpool fans of being drunk and violent and their actions were vile, and the Daily Express ran a story alleging that police saw sick spectacle of pilfering from the dying. Peter McKay in the Evening Standard wrote that the catastrophe was caused first and foremost by violent enthusiasm for soccer and in this case the tribal passions of Liverpool supporters literally killed themselves and others to be at the game and published a front-page headline Police Attack Vile Fans on April 18, 1989, in which police sources blamed the behaviour of a section of Liverpool fans for the disaster. In Liverpool local journalist John Williams of the Liverpool Daily Post wrote, in an article titled I Blame the Yobs that the Gatecrashers wreaked their fatal havoc. Their uncontrolled fanaticism and mass hysteria, literally squeezed the life out of men, women, and children, Yobism at its most base. Scouse killed Scouse for no better reason than 22 men were kicking a ball. In other regional newspapers, the Manchester Evening News wrote that the Anfield Army charged onto the terrace behind the goal many without tickets and the Yorkshire Post wrote that the trampling crush had been started by thousands of fans who were latecomers, forked their way into the ground. The Sheffield Star published similar allegations to The Sun, running the headline Fans in Drunken Attacks on Police. Many of the more serious allegations such as stealing from the dead and assault of police officers and rescue workers appeared on April 18 although several evening newspapers published on April 15, 1989 also gave an accurate reporting of the disaster, as these newspapers went to press before the full extent or circumstances of the disaster had been confirmed or even reported. This included the Wolverhampton-based Express and Star, which reported that the match had been cancelled as a result of a pitch invasion in which many fans were injured. This article was presumably published before there were any reports that people had been killed. These media reports and others were examined during the 2012 Hillsborough Independent Panel Report. I The Sun Slash I None I The Times Slash I None I FHM Slash I None I The Spectator Slash I 
none. I Eastenders slash I. None. Charles Attange. Liverpool goalkeeper Charles Attange was accused of having shown disrespect towards the Hillsborough victims during the 2009 Remembrance Ceremony, as he was spotted on camera smiling and nudging teammate Damien Plessis. He was suspended from the club for a fortnight and many fans felt he should not play for the club again. He was omitted from the first team squad and never played for the club in any capacity again. Jeremy Hunt On June 28, 2010, following England's departure from the 2010 FIFA World Cup competition in South Africa, the UK's culture and sports secretary Jeremy Hunt praised the England fans for their behaviour during the competition, saying I mean, not a single arrest for a football-related offence, and the terrible problems that we had in Heisel and Hillsborough in the 1980s seem now to be behind us. He later apologised and said I know that fan unrest played no part in the terrible events of April 1989 and I apologise to Liverpool fans and the families of those killed and injured in the Hillsborough disaster if my comments caused any offence. Margaret Aspinall, chairperson of the Hillsborough Family Support Group, asked for a face-to-face -face meeting with Hunt before deciding if she would accept the apology. Fans Chance Fans of rival clubs have been known to chant about the Hillsborough disaster at football matches, in order to upset Liverpool fans. Following the findings of the independent panel in September 2012, Alex Ferguson and two Manchester United fan groups called for an end to the sick chants. Leeds United chairman Ken Bates endorsed this call in the club programme and stated, Leeds have suffered at times with reference to Galatasaray, some of our so-called fans have also been guilty as well, particularly in relation to Munich. Munich is a reference to the deaths of eight Manchester United players in the Munich Air disaster of 1958. Oliver Popplewell In October 2011, Sir Oliver Popplewell, who chaired the public inquiry into the 1985 Bradford City Stadium fire at Valley Parade that killed 56 people, called on the families of the Hillsborough victims to look at the quiet dignity and great courage relatives in the West Yorkshire city had shown in the years following the tragedy. He said, the citizens of Bradford behaved with quiet dignity and great courage. They did not harbour conspiracy theories. They did not seek endless further inquiries. They buried their dead, comforted the bereaved and succoured the injured. They organised a sensible compensation scheme and moved on. Is there, perhaps, a lesson there for the Hillsborough campaigners? Popplewell was criticised for the comments, including a rebuke from a survivor of the Bradford fire. Labour MP Steve Rotheram, commented, How insensitive does somebody have to be to write that load of drivel? David Crompton In 2013, a formal complaint was made against David Crompton, South Yorkshire's chief constable, over internal emails relating to the Hillsborough disaster. On September 8, 2012, just four days before the Hillsborough Independent Panel report was published, Crompton had emailed the force's assistant chief constable Andy Holt and head of media Mark Thompson. In the email, which came to light as the result of a Freedom of Information request, Crompton had said that the family's version of certain events has become the truth even though it isn't. South Yorkshire's Police and Crime Commissioner Sean Wright appointed Chief Constable Simon Parr of Cambridgeshire Constabulary to head an investigation into the matter. Wright said, the request has been submitted by a firm of solicitors in Liverpool acting on behalf of a number of individuals affected by the event. In March 2016, Crompton announced that he would retire in November. On April 26, 2016, after the inquest jury delivered a verdict affirming all the charges against the police, Crompton unequivocally accepted the verdicts, including unlawful killing, said that the police operation at the stadium on the day of the disaster had been catastrophically wrong, and apologized unreservedly. Following continued criticism of Crompton in the wake of the unlawful killing verdict, 
South Yorkshire Police and Crime Commissioner Alan Billings suspended Crompton from duty on April 27, 2016. Civil Servant In June 2014, an unnamed 24-year-old British civil servant was sacked for posting offensive comments about the disaster on Wikipedia. Stephen Cohen In 2009, nearly 20 years to the day after the disaster, Stephen Cohen, a presenter on Fox Soccer Channel and Sirius Satellite Radio in the United States, stated on his radio show that Liverpool fans without tickets were the root cause and perpetrators of the disaster. A boycott of advertisers by American Liverpool fans eventually brought about an apology from him. Despite this he was replaced as presenter of Fox Football Phone-In. His actions were disowned by Chelsea Football Club and he no longer works as a broadcaster. Bernard Ingham In 1996, Sir Bernard Ingham, former press secretary to former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, caused controversy with his comments about the disaster. In a letter addressed to a victim's parent, Ingham wrote that the disaster was caused by tanked-up yobs. In another letter written to a Liverpool supporter, also written in 1996, Ingham remarked that people should shut up about Hillsborough. On the day of the inquest verdict, Ingham refused to apologize or respond to the previous comments he made, telling a reporter, I have nothing to say. There have since been calls to have Ingham stripped of his knighthood. Top Man In March 2018, British clothing retailer Topman marketed a T-shirt which was interpreted by members of the public, including relatives of Hillsborough victims, as mocking the disaster. The T-shirt was red with white details like a Liverpool shirt, and had the number 96 on the back like a football shirt, with the text Karma and what goes around comes back around, and a white rose, as associated with Yorkshire. Topman stated that the T-shirt was in reference to a Bob Marley song re-released in 1996 and apologized and withdrew the item. Radio, Television, and Theatre 1989, I After Dark I. None. 1996, I Hillsborough I. None. 2009, I The Reunion I. None. 2014, I Hillsborough I. None. 2022, I and slash I. None. Stage plays. Two British stage plays also dealt with the disaster with different viewpoints. Jonathan Harvey's Guiding Star showed a father coming to terms with what had happened some years later. Lance Nielsen wrote Waiting for Hillsborough about two Liverpool families waiting for news of their missing loved ones on the day, which leads to discussion of football safety and the culture of blame. Nielsen's play won him an award at the 1999 Liverpool Arts and Entertainment Awards and was highly praised by the Liverpool Press. Notes